Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this edition. Please join me with a gener generous applause for um, our friend and ally, super activist, Jen Wood. You're welcome. Okay, well that's embarrassing. Oh, thanks Maureen. We're just so lucky to have Maureen on our board and she, every time she comes to every board meeting, it brings us closer to thinking about how our work at the center connects to the labor movement more broadly because we're actually all working on the same things and Maureen's great at always keeping that front and center when we're talking about what we need to prioritize at the Center for Justice. But I really want to thank you for the opportunity to come. This is your convention and executive committee meeting and it's really an honor to be with you all this evening. A lot of you are old friends. I know many of you, we've been in struggles together. We've been on the same side of the table. We've been on the other side of tables, but we've always been working with respect towards common goals. And uh, it's also an honor to be in the room with those of you who I don't know personally, because I feel like I know you because I know the great work that you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this room tonight. Um, you're in the room because your passion is protecting and expanding workers' rights, and human rights. The Rhode Island Center for Justice was formed in 2015 because we recognized that was, there was a serious gap um, in access to justice for working families in Rhode Island, and now we're trying to work every day to close that gap. We're a small center. We're three full-time lawyers and two recent law graduates who come to us from Roger Williams Law School every two years after, and spend two years with us after they graduate to get on the job training in becoming a public interest lawyer. We expand our impact by working with community groups to punch above our weight. By partnering with Fuerza Laboral, who is here today, thank you Fuerza, um, the Immigrant Coalition, parents, teachers, and student organizing groups in the public schools, we're able to serve many more groups who have been treated unjustly than we would be able to help just on our own with our five staff members, which you know, you all, you all work in places, so you know what that means. Um, like the AFL-CIO, we employ a simple proposition. Taking action as a group is more powerful than taking action alone. It's that simple. By joining together and partnering with community organizations, we're able to reach many more working families so that they can gain access to justice that they would never otherwise be able to achieve. Because lawyers are expensive, and we're a nonprofit law center, so when we represent someone, we do it for free. And that's because we have philanthropic support, donations from people like you and many outside this room that make it possible for us to do our work. I don't need to look any further than the AFL-CIO mission statement to guide our work. Quote, we dedicate ourselves to improving the lives of working families bringing fairness and dignity to the workplace, and securing social equity in the nation. That pretty much sums it up. That is also the mission of the Rhode Island Center for Justice. Based on your mission, 80,000 workers are protected by their AFL-CIO bargaining representatives in Rhode Island. This is so essential in protecting all workers because we know that unionized workers' rights that are hard fought become the rights that all workers rely on. Wage and hour laws, occupational health and safety, protections against discrimination and unfair actions by supervisors, these are all rights that unions have fought and won and that all workers rely on and many take for granted. The non-unionized workforce benefits from your hard work. History shows us that is true. However, there are 500,000 workers in Rhode Island, most of whom don't have the benefit of union protections, unfortunately. We are your partners in protecting those who don't have access to union membership at this time. 
and through Working Rhode Island and other coalitions, we support your efforts to continue to grow union membership, particularly in areas that have been traditionally underrepresented by unions, like childcare, healthcare, the hotel industry, and other areas of the economy that have traditionally shut out union organizing. I'd like to share three areas of our work with you today. Our work with non-unionized workers who are being robbed by their employers, our work with immigrants relating to their civil rights, and our work to establish a constitutional right to adequate public education. In partnership with Fuerza Laboral, we do identify workers who are being subjected to wage theft in the, work, in the workplace. Most people who just are out there doing their daily jobs are pretty shocked to learn that sometimes workers, especially those who, like immigrants, employers may think do not know their rights, sometimes don't only not get paid minimum wage and overtime according to the law, but sometimes they don't get paid at all. These employers are literally stealing the labor from their workers in full or in part. And I'm not telling the people in this room anything, but there are many Rhode Islanders who have no clue that this is going on or at the wide scale basis that it's going on. Some workers are illegally exploited and forced into substandard wages, and that ends up eroding the ability of all workers to demand fair wages. Wage theft hurts all workers, including union workers, because it erodes the integrity of the wage system overall. The DLT and the Federal Department of Labor investigate these situations, but that can take years. We're able to bring class action or group action cases on behalf of whole workforces in restaurants, grocery stores, landscaping businesses, and cleaning businesses, places where these violations are rampant in Rhode Island, to get back wages and other damages for these workers more quickly. Sometimes groups of workers are owed hundreds of thousands of dollars for claims going back several years. And the investigations of these situations by government agencies can take years to conclude. Low wage workers often can't wait that long. In these cases, justice deferred truly may become justice denied unless we're able to step in and bring a suit and try and get people the back wages they're owed before they go bankrupt, before they have to leave the state or seek another solution. Doing these cases not only wins back wages and damages for workers whose wages have been stolen, it also changes the practices of the employers, which is a big goal of this work. In one recent case, we brought a suit in federal court in partnership with Fuerza on behalf of dozens of workers, most of whom were immigrants who did not speak English and who worked for a large multi-state landscaping maintenance company. After we filed the suit and even before we got a favorable wage settlement for these workers, the employer changed its personnel practices to begin officially paying overtime to the whole category of workers who we were representing as our clients. Not only those we represented, but all future hires. To me, actually, that change was as exciting as getting the money back in the workers' pockets for the wages that had been stolen, because that meant that all of the future workers in that company were not going to be ripped off. Last year, we demanded back wages for a woman who had cared for an elderly family member in a quite wealthy family for 12 years and never got paid according to any law. They gave her a roof over her head and occasional small cash payments. She did everything for the elderly parent of this family, including caring for her during her hospice care. When the elderly family member was dying, the family fired the caregiver with no notice, never even giving her the opportunity to say goodbye to the woman she had been caring for for over a decade. These categories of domestic workers are excluded from a lot of the protection of the wage and hour laws and are also excluded from unionization. But these are desperately needed protections. We were able to demand thousands of dollars of back wages for this caregiver, who not surprisingly was also an immigrant. And the employer thought they could get away with simply not paying her at all. So George asked me to address this evening in light of that story. Who needs to be standing up for immigrants in this moment in our country? 
And I feel a very personal stake in this because I think all of us in the United States have a direct personal connection to immigrant stories. And that it's people who look like me um, and who um, were born in this country and speak English with ease as a first language who need to be on the front lines of fighting the fight for immigrant justice. Um, you know, I, I think every one of us comes from a mixed status background when we think about immigration in the United States. Uh, on one side of my family, my dad was an 11th generation American. He um, grew up, he was born in the United States, but grew up most of his early years in Europe because one of his parents was from Europe. And he lived in Germany. And when the Nazis started to come to power in Germany, his father, who was his American parent, had already passed away. And he said to his German mother, we need to get out of here um, because this situation is going sideways fast and what's happening here is not something that anyone should tolerate. So they got on a boat and this, you know, my dad was born in 1918, so they got on a boat and came back to the United States. And four years later, he was going back to Germany in the US Army. And my dad taught me, based on his experience watching the rise of fascism in Europe, to never trust authority, always question everything, and to stand up for the rights of people who are being oppressed. <laughs> on, on my husband's side of the family, we're descended proudly from illegal immigrants, so-called, because my husband's family is Chinese American. He's a fourth generation American. When his family was seeking to immigrate to this country, the first uh, immigration laws that had been in place in the United States were the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which excluded an entire category of humans simply based on their race. So it's a, it was an unjust and later deemed to be illegal law that needed to be resisted. And so I'm proud to say that his family was part of that resistance. So even though I may look like a you know, pretty standard American, um, I think that we all have these stories if we embrace them, and we all need to be the people who are standing up for immigrant rights because it's our family, it's our neighbors' families, it's everyone's family. And so that's kind of why we exist at the Center for Justice, to fight the fights that wouldn't otherwise happen because the workers that I've told you about tonight are not represented by a union, and they should be, but they would have a hard time finding a private lawyer to take their case. Um, we represent our clients for free, like I said, and we couldn't do that without donations from people like you. In addition to our direct work to prevent wage theft, we're also very active with the Immigrant Coalition in Rhode Island. This is a coalition of over 30 community organizations that has come together in the last couple of years because we've seen a lot of injustice happening in our environment. At the Center for Justice, we don't do visa representation, but we work to protect the civil and human rights of our Rhode Island neighbors, many of whom are living in fear. Many of our immigrant brothers and sisters are living in circumstances that it would be hard for most of us to really imagine at this time. Um, as part of that coalition, we won legislation that provided driver's licenses for DACA recipients two years ago, and we're working to fight for driver's licenses for all immigrants so that people can get to and from work safely, and so that we all know that the other motorists on our roadways are licensed. It's a simple public safety issue. We have support from the Attorney General's Office and other on this issues, but unfortunately it's been hard to achieve. We've also worked to develop family preparedness plans for immigrants to complete so that they can ensure that their US citizen children born in this country will have a stable and safe home if the worst happens and the parent gets deported. Um, we obtained a grant so that there's now a lawyer in Rhode Island doing pro bono representation of people in family separation, deportation, and asylum cases who's already won asylum for a number of immigrants being held at the Wyatt Detention Center. So last winter, we hosted a family preparation event in a public school in Central Falls. I sat with a woman who is the single parent of three children under the age of 10. She was so worried about what would happen to her children if she was detained or deported. Her children are US citizens and have a legal right to be in this country. We worked together to identify a relative of hers 
who is also a US citizen, and then completed all of the necessary paperwork, guardianship, healthcare, education, authorizations that she needed to make sure that her children would be cared for if she became unavailable. Some children come home from school and their parents aren't there. And unless there's a plan in place, no one really knows what's going to happen with those children. And it can be totally terrifying, even if that never happens, just to sit at home worrying about that happening. The peace of mind that she gained, knowing that her children would have a trusted, loving guardian if they were separated, is hard to describe. Sitting with families and doing these plans is a pretty profound experience. And you know, luckily, I worked at Riot in the past. And so we know something about education rules and education law. And it's pretty simple, actually, to provide these documents to families. But without that kind of help, they would just be really without help and living in a situation where they wouldn't know what would happen to their kids if something bad happened to them. Finally, many of you have heard about the suit we filed on behalf of all Rhode Island public school children. We insist that the US Constitution protects the right to an adequate public education for all kids. Some of Rhode Island's public schools are world class and doing an amazing job. Unfortunately, often based on your zip code, not all students and families have access to those schools. In some communities, teachers are asked to reach into their own pockets to make up for inadequate and unequitable school funding. Mary Beth Calabro and your members in Providence know this all too well. They're on the firing line on this issue. We're working with students, student organizations, and parent organizations to demand that all public schools should be adequately funded to provide all children with the history, civics instructions, and other educational basics they need to meaningfully participate in the institutions of democracy as adults. Young people who don't get history classes, and I've spoken with high school students in urban public schools in Rhode Island who haven't had social studies on their student schedule for years. Like, I mean, think about it. Any of us who graduated from high school, you took four years of social studies or history. Imagine a scenario in which you get that like for one or two years in high school. It, it kind of blows my mind. These young people, if they're systematically deprived of history, civics, debate team, field trips, and all the things that we know a high quality and adequately resourced public education can provide, they're not going to be union leaders when they grow up. They're not going to be activated voters. They're not going to run for office. Um, they're not going to become community leaders participate on juries, and do all the things that a robust democracy requires of all of us. We take that for granted. The teachers who work in the most under-resourced school systems are blamed for the breakdown of learning and student results. But our suit will change that unfair and inequitable reality nationwide if we win. In an adequate public education, if it is a constitutional right under the US Constitution, then we won't be fighting state by state and city by city, like the Chicago Teachers Union and the Providence Teachers Union are doing today. We will make education, the funding of public education, a national priority. And it won't be at the state level to determine what happens. And, thanks. If an excellent public education is a constitutional right, it will be a priority in every year's budget. And it will be protected at that level, at the constitutional level. That's a game changer, frankly, for us as a nation. We're proud to be able to bring that case. Um, and obviously, it has nationwide implications. And I have to um, give a personal note here, because one of the people who kind of trained me coming up was one of your lions, and that's Marsha Reback. And uh, Marsha scared the hell out of me when I was a kid lawyer, <laughs> starting to do work in this field. Um, mostly when I started out, I was representing young people and families in cases. And uh, she schooled me pretty good on many occasions. Um, but you know, I really feel her presence with me when we're doing this constitutional claim, because she would be all in for that proposition. 
And, um, you know, I feel, I feel really good about that. And um, I want to thank her posthumously for having taught me some things that I needed to know about how public education works. Um, you know, I really want to thank George and Maureen who have just supported us from the, from the very beginning of the center and supported us early and often. Um, a lot of the representation I've talked about tonight really wasn't available when the center was founded. I started out my career in legal services, you heard that tonight, and you know, I have such respect for the other legal aid organizations in Rhode Island, but many of them are not authorized to do the work that we do because of funding restrictions. Um, when I worked at legal services, we were able to do class actions, we were able to represent immigrants, but the Reagan administration put a stop to that and put pretty severe restrictions on what federal funding for legal services can be used for. So now the Center for Justice is there to fill that gap. Um, and, you know, like I said, we're kind of small but mighty. Um, we're a much smaller program than others, but we're really trying to fill in the work that others are not able to do. So I want to thank you so much for all the work that you do to support workers' rights, and I want to thank you for supporting us to do the work that is in those gaps that are not covered by union protections and may not otherwise have access to a lawyer. Um, without you, we actually don't exist. Without you, we can't do the work that we do. And um, I want to thank you for the support you've already given us and for all the work that we're going to be doing together in the future. Thank you very much. I don't know about you, but uh I think that's a group we could get behind. I think this is, uh, you know, wage theft, immigration rights, constitutional rights to education. If we're not going to support them, who the hell else will? So let's, uh, we'll be planning a few events in the future, so remember some of the remarks today. And, and Jen, thank you for what you do and the fights that you fight for working people, for immigrants, for children. and. Uh, that was, that was terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce the very effervescent business representative for the Rhode Island Painters Union, Justin <laughs> Kelly. It, it, go, it goes without saying that he is a steadfast, strong, and engaging voice for the building trades. He is a grassroots organizer and can rally the troops like no other in the building trades. As a matter of fact, I think we need to have a new nickname for Justin Kelly. We need to call him the rooster from now on because nobody can wake people up in the building trades or any other labor union like Justin Kelly. <laughs> Come on, let's hear your crow, brother. Well, cock a doodle doo, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jimmy, first of all, you can tell me where you go shopping at because I like your style. <laughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, I, first of all, bring greetings from Brother President Sabatoni, of the, who is the president not only of the Laborers District Council here in Rhode Island, but also of the Rhode Island Building and Construction Trades. Also from Secretary Treasurer Scott Duhamel of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, and Vice President Tim Byrne, the president of the United Association Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Local 51. Really, the best leadership that we could ask for. Great people who are dedicated not only to improving the lives of their members, but of all working people, but also of the community as a whole. All of us together, working together to create a greater good. Because isn't that really what it's all about? We're all here because somebody's helped us out in life. And that's what today's about, but it's important to reflect on where we came from, including myself. I wouldn't be here with the help, without the help of those men, without the help of all of you. So let's just give it up for that, helping each other and not forgetting that good. Because that's what the trade union movement does. We work together to support each other on and off the job because we know that this type of thing is not only just a good thing to do, but it builds the strong communities that we need 
to have where we live and work. So that's why we're here today. We're here also to recognize the contributions, efforts of women in organized labor. And I want to give a shout out to someone who's very special to me, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, Maureen Martin. Let's give it up. I also want to recognize a couple of my members, Kristen Scungio, Latoya Williams, who are here, and all of the other women who are part of the Women in the Trades, as part of the Building Trades Women's Committee. Organized labor, go ahead, clap for that, please. Organized labor is the one place where you can say with guarantee that it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you do the same work, you get the same pay. You get the same benefits. That's across the board. In all trades, in all crafts, in all industries. When you have a union contract, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, where you're from, if you're a man or a woman, you're gay, you're straight, you get the same pay and benefits. And that's what the trade union movement's about. It's also about remembering brave individuals like young Hannah Wharton and her family. Let's give another round of applause, please. Because that means something. We need to remember those who are here to help, and we need to do it together. So thank you, brothers and sisters. And back to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Mayor of Providence, Jorge Alorza. He knows the importance of investing in cities, roads, bridges, infrastructure, and putting those in the building trades to work and keeping them at work. He supports the work of the AFL CIO and that of Rhode Island public servants who keep our communities running smoothly and efficiently. Mayor, I hope you have Omar with you, do you not? Yes, you do. He's, he's all, you all, whenever you see the mayor now, you see Omar. Thank you, and welcome Omar. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, I'm with my little assistant today. But the truth is that um, he's really the one that calls the shots. So I'm going to have to peel off in just a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and leave you all here in the park in this beautiful day uh, for this great cause. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to be here to, first of all, show my support and share with you why I think that uh, this work is so important. Before I get into that, I want to give a big shout out to Jim and to Justin, two great leaders in the union and the union movement and the union uh, community here in the state of Rhode Island. So I appreciate everything that you do, everything you do for um, uh, our men and women, uh, but also everything that you do for our state as a whole. I want to recognize Maureen Martin. I appreciate your leadership and everything that you've done to support working families throughout our state as well. So thank you very much. And the reason why I make an effort to be here every single year is because of this partnership between the building trades, the unions as a whole, and the big brothers and big sisters of Rhode Island. You know, some of you know my story. My parents came to this country as immigrants. They came with absolutely nothing. But they worked hard, they played by the rules. Little by little, they worked their way up. And my mother would always tell me, even though she only has a fifth grade education, to go to school, to take it seriously, and to get educated. Uh. However, as a young person growing up on Cranston Street, you don't always follow the best advice and, some, uh. and sometimes uh. you just make bad decisions. Uh. And I remember that I barely graduated from high school and uh, I got rejected from every college that I applied to. And I remember that throughout my entire educational career, the only reason that I've been able to make it through and be here today is because I've had people in my life, guardian angels, that have believed in me more than I believed them in myself at different times in my lifetime. And they have made it so that instead of going down the wrong path, I've been able to go down the right path. And all of you who either volunteer or you help support the big brothers and big sisters of Rhode Island, you are those same guardian angels that are putting your arms around our kids and making sure that they stay on the right path. And I can tell you that the kids that you're hurt, working with and supporting, they may not ever know about the contributions that you make to them.
But when it's all said and done, they're going to be on the right path. And we're going to know as an entire community that we help support the next generation to set them on the right path and make sure that they're contributing citizens and that they're able to provide for their families uh, just like all of us want to do for ours here in Rhode Island. So thank you so much for everything that you do and I look forward to working for so many more years to make sure that this event continues strong and the work of everyone here continues just as strong throughout the state. Thank you so much everybody. Have a great day today. Thank you, Mayor and Omar. That was an excellent duet. We are very excited to have Mike Montecalvo to serve as our honor chair, honorary chairperson this year. As you all know, Mike is an award-winning journalist who co-anchors a 5 p.m., 5.36, and 11 p.m. newscasts on PRI 12 and the 10 p.m. news on Fox Providence. That's a lot of news there, Mike. A Woonsocket native, Mike is a graduate of LaSalle Academy as well as Rhode Island College. He has been a broadcast journalist in the Rhode Island and Connecticut markets since 1981. A multiple Emmy-nominated anchor and reporter, Mike has received more than 40 community service and associated press awards. Despite his grueling schedule as a devoted husband and father of his two beautiful daughters, he willingly gives of his time and talent to help charities in the state. Mike, I know you have another charitable fundraiser today, so we thank you for taking the time to be here with the big brothers and big sisters, I should say. Come on up and say a few words, Mike. Thank you. thank you, Jim. Thank you very much for inviting me again this year. I actually just automatically put it on my calendar now, even though uh, Gina calls me, so thank you. By the way, just so you know, Hannah's picture is on my desk. She gave me a picture uh, a couple of years ago when she was at the walk, so it sits on our desk. So everybody at Channel 12 still remembers Hannah. Uh, you never know who's involved in uh, big brothers and big sisters. Uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Alzheimer's walk, my cousin Tom, he called me and he said he wanted to come to the walk and he was taking his uh, little friend with him. And uh, Tom is not married, he has no kids. So I said, sure, and they come to the walk and sure enough, my cousin, who I never knew this, was a, has been a big brother for the last uh, year and a half. So as we're walking along, I find, you, know, you finally have to ask the question, you know, Tommy, why did you ever become a big brother? He says, well, I'm not married, I don't have any kids, and I always wanted to know what that was like to be a father. So he decided to be a big brother, and this is now his best friend. They've gone to uh, the pumpkin uh, spectacular at the zoo, they go to ball games, Tommy says he has a hard time helping him with his homework, but all of us who are parents know that that's a, a problem for us with our kids. But this little boy who goes to Thompson uh, School in uh, Newport has changed my cousin's life just with one phone call. And that's really what Big Brothers and Big Sisters is all about. But a story that I read a couple of weeks ago really kind of sums it up. There's a firefighter, his name is John, spent his life running into burning buildings uh, on a rescue, saving people. Uh, John was paralyzed in an accident and obviously can't work anymore. He decided he wanted to do something with his life to give back, and he became a big brother. And for the last three years, he and his uh, little have spent every moment they can together. And in the end of the story, John says, it was Dorrance who actually saved my life. John now got married, he has kids of his own, but Dorrance is still a part of his family. And that's really what the organization is all about. So thank you to Big Brothers and Big Sisters for all you do. We truly appreciate it. You've made the community and you've made Rhode Island a much better place. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week. Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.